there's something about giving and receiving, isn't it? Because missionaries in the past were giving, but now those of us from those former colonies, we feel we have matured to a place where we can give. And oftentimes the Western world don't like to receive, so it's a big problem. It challenges, it challenges our power dynamics that we don't want to receive. Sometimes we could conceive receiving as weakness, but receiving is not weakness. This is Out of the Margins podcast. The podcast space, especially in the Christian world, is saturated by Western voices. But if we want a diversity of thought to face the future together, we need to step back and hear voices from out of the margins. Here, we will be offering insights from experiences and perspectives from the majority world. My name is Edgar. And I'm Simon. And on each episode, we will be bringing to you our conversations with pastors, leaders, and scholars from the majority world. This podcast is brought to you by Young Langham Australia. As our global community grows and changes, so too does the way that we look at mission. In recent years, we've seen a reverse in the flow of migration. What was once a movement of colonial powers from the wealthy West bringing missionaries out to the majority world is now a much more diverse and multi-directional exchange of people and ideas. Yet, for some reason, many of us in the West still think that mission is about heading out to places like Africa, Asia, South America and the Middle East, as if we're the only ones who have something to teach. Today, we explore the concept of reverse mission as we listen to our brother and sister from the majority world, Wanjiro Miriyoki and Dr. Israel Alofinjana, and consider what we might have to learn from them instead. So, hello and welcome to the second episode of the Out of the Margins podcast. It's wonderful to be with you today, Edgar. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here with you. Back to episode two of the Out of the Margins podcast. So, reverse mission, this is actually a topic that you chose originally. <coughs> and so, I wanted to ask you up front, what interested you about reverse mission? Well, I can tell you about two reasons why I'm interested in this topic. The first one is that my wife and I, for different reasons, we are involved already in reverse mission. I am from Mexico and my wife is from Kenya. And we both serve in different capacities here in the church in Australia. And the second thing is that we are planning on moving to Mexico in the future to join a mobilization team in the north of Mexico. What that means is that we will be involved in training and supporting those in Mexico who are going to go on cross-cultural mission. And so you can see now how I am interested in this topic and how relevant this topic is for me and hence why I'm excited about this topic. Yeah, I have to admit that when I first heard about it, I, I was a little bit cold on the idea. Not because I don't want to hear the gospel from Mexicans, but <laughs> that we've got this concept at Langham Partnership that it's really important for people to preach the gospel within their context. I mean, that's what we were talking about last time. And so there was a sense for me that if people from the majority world are coming to the West, it, it's bringing a lot of the same issues as people from the West trying to come into the majority world in that there's people who don't necessarily understand the culture, that there's a that there's a sort of cultural headbutting going on there. And so really that the best people to reach the slowly waning in religiosity mm. West are evangelicals already in the West. So that's where I was at the start of these interviews. But I, I really wanted to know what this reverse mission thing was all about. Um, so I... Uh, I sat down separately with Shiro and Israel, who are both involved in reverse mission in their own ways, and, and they've really helped me to understand what's going on here. But uh, first, I wanted to get to know them a little better.
My name's are Israel Oluwole Olofinjano. Currently, I work with the Evangelical Alliance here in the UK, and I sit on the senior leadership team. Um, so I'm one of the directors of the Evangelical Alliance UK. And I have responsibility for uh, looking after two networks, uh, network initiatives of EA. One is called the One People Commission, and then the other is called South Asian Forum. Uh, but they're very linked. And One People Commission, basically, best way to describe it is that is a network that brings together uh, the diverse church leaders in Britain. So it brings together uh, African church leaders, uh, Caribbean church leaders, Latin American church leaders, South Asian church leaders, Chinese church leaders, and South Korean church leaders. So we, we try to model unity in diversity in what we do. And the South Asian Forum aspect of that network brings together South Asian Christian leaders, which are drawn from India, Sri Lanka, Nepalese, you know, and Pakistan. So so that's what I do, uh, having the oversight of, of, over those uh, two networks. Wow, that's really exciting. Uh, and so today, the topic that we're talking about is reverse mission. There's some sense in which that diverse group of people are all engaging in reverse mission in Britain. Um, but, but can you tell us a bit about how you're currently engaged in reverse mission? So I can I came as a missionary migrant to the UK in 2004. And the reason why I'm using that choice of words specifically is oftentimes people who are coming from the majority world into the Western world perceived by society as economic migrants, as refugees, as asylum seekers. And of course, I, I do understand that people are fleeing their homes for various reasons, either that's because of persecution or that's because of war. Or that's because of economics or social dynamics. People are on the move. Uh, but my own particular story is that I came as a missionary to the UK. I was sent by my Pentecostal church in Nigeria. Also, as part of that, I came to further my theological education in the UK. So I came with that sense, with that notion of what you might describe as a reverse missionary. Uh, and I think there is something there in my story that when we think about missionaries, even in today's context, it's very easy to still think that missionaries are still white and that they have to be sent by a mission organization with people praying for them and sending newsletters. Of course, there is still a place for that. I'm not knocking that out. But what I'm simply saying is that the way mission is happening today, a refugee could be a missionary, an asylum seeker could be a missionary, an economic migrant could be a missionary. In fact, they are the missionaries of today uh, that there is a term by Latin American project or Samuel Escobar that described these sort of missionaries as missionaries from below. That is, we are coming as individuals. We are coming as not necessarily well-trained, but most importantly, we are coming from a suffering context, whether that's through political instability or uh, recession. And so we are coming from a place where life has been tough and so survival and existing is a, of, a of a priority to people coming from the majority world. But nevertheless, we sense God is still calling us. And so those of us who used to be at the receiving end of Western mission uh, agenda are now contributing the forefront of mission field in the Western world. And so that's what reverse mission is about. So in a way, we could say reverse mission helps us to address and redress the power in balance in mission history and practice by centering the experiences of people from the majority world so that they are perceived as givers instead of just receiving. I'm really looking forward to talking to you more today, but really important, it's become sort of a running joke in the law of our podcast because we have people from Asia and people from South America and Africa. How do you drink your tea? This is going to shock a lot of your uh, viewers or people who listen to this because um, I am actually one of the few Africans who actually don't drink tea. But if I must drink tea or if I decide to have tea, what I usually have is herbal tea. And so that's the way I drink my tea. I go for a herbal drink and uh, a, little bit, a little bit with honey sometimes. Uh, I like that. Or sometimes I prefer it lemon prefer it with lemon so yeah so yeah so that's the way 
Mm, and and milk or no milk? Definitely no milk. Definitely no. Milk. No milk. Okay. No well, milk. That's probably the most controversial answer. I can speak. Hello, I'm Shiro. Uh, Wanjiro Moriyuki is my full name. Um, most people call me Shiro, which is the short for Wanjiro, and um, it's a real privilege to be here today. Uh, so at the moment, actually, I'm an ordinant. I'm training to become ordained in the Anglican Church here in New Zealand. So currently I'm studying at St. John's Theological College. And so how are you currently involved in reverse mission? I guess because I'm here working in the church and I'm not originally from New Zealand, then I suppose that counts. Is that how it works? Um, yeah, I, I yeah. think that definitely counts. Certainly in my discussion with Israel yesterday, that's what yeah. it's all about. So, yeah, I, de- I definitely think that counts. Yeah. Okay, so this is maybe the most important question in the law of our podcast. Great. And I will pre-warn you that Israel... Uh, gave a very controversial answer to this question. So I would like to know, how do you drink your tea? I I have two parts to this question. The first part is I grew up drinking my tea, like black tea made over a pot with milk, half milk, half water, has to be like boiled. Um, And I love having it like that with some spices, like a chai tea. Um, but upon moving to New Zealand, that isn't, wasn't really an option. And so I've now come to really enjoy having my tea with like either a splash of milk or just black. So if I'm having black tea with a splash of milk, um, otherwise I love an all grey black tea. So your tea preferences have been integrated into the New Zealand culture? Yeah, yeah. You could even say downgraded, <laughs> but I'll take integrated. So if we can handle moving on from the tea controversy, uh, let's go back to reverse mission for a second. Um, so uh, I was I, I was actually, I think, coming to this topic from a really Western perspective. I was taking everything that I understood about missionary organizations here in Australia and then mapping them onto the majority world. My expectation was dedicated vocational missionaries who were funded by organizations who were coming to the West to street preach or plant churches or do community projects, sort of the same way that we go into the majority world now. And I I think that's the vision that I wasn't sure about. So I wanted to ask you, Edgar, as somebody who grew up in a different context, tell me, what was your understanding of reverse mission? Well, I understand that mission is going through this movement, that there is this shift of the center of Christianity from the West to the majority world. In fact, that's a foundation of of why Langham exists. And as someone from from Mexico, I am from Latin America, for that matter, I, I am aware and interested as well in the, the different ways that the that the church in Latin America contributes to the global mission and how and the role that it plays in that mission. Although I wasn't aware and I wouldn't refer to my own ministry as reverse mission until until I heard what Israel and Shiro had to say about it. You had a way better idea of what we were talking about than um than I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I don't know, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I'm very passionate about this. Yeah, that's fantastic. As uh, sometimes I, I think when we're speaking interculturally, we can talk past each other with definitions. So uh, one of the things that I really wanted to understand was that what Shiro and Israel were talking about um, when they talked about reverse mission. So I asked them to define reverse mission for themselves. And I wanted to go really, really deep into what this thing actually was. And well, it sounds like you wouldn't have found their responses particularly surprising, but I certainly did. (laughs) So how would you define reverse mission? Uh, mission from the majority world essentially to the West. Maybe has a little bit less intentionality to it, I think, sometimes. I'm not sure that everybody coming from the majority world to the West is thinking about doing it specifically to share the gospel. But also, I think there's a part of it that is is just really intentional. So it's, it's people who have received the gospel in quotes from the West and are now 
um, bringing it back. And I say in quotes just because if you trace, trace back the history of Christianity, part of it, at least for Africa, started in the northern part of Africa. So there's a sense it was already in the continent before. I mean, yeah, um, you, you only need to read the Bible to find that out. Yes, yeah. The reverse mission centers the experiences of those of us from the majority world. I think reverse mission is a post-colonial way of conceiving mission uh, because it, it is those it is people coming from former colonies who are now coming to evangelize their colonial masters or leaders in the past. We see that, that there is something about people who were at the receiving end of mission and colonization who have now matured and come to a place where they feel they can contribute to mission uh, practice as it is. And so they, they are being sent intentionally uh, to come. But it, the, the thing about reverse mission is that it's not just only about the intentionality. Uh, as I said earlier, people come because they come for other reasons, but then as they get here, they do realize that God has called them uh, and that they are here, you know, to uh, you know to 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 engage in mission, uh, or to plant a church, or to be involved in different ways. So re reverse mission sort of displaces the power imbalance uh, in mission history and practice, centering the experiences of those of us from the majority world. Uh, I suppose there's something about giving and receiving, isn't it? Because missionaries in the past were giving. But now, those of us from those former colonies, we feel we have matured to a place where we can give. And oftentimes the Western world don't like to receive. So it's a big problem because I think that it, challenges, it challenges our power dynamics that we don't want to receive. And so sometimes people question reverse mission uh, because of the power dynamics and because it puts, it puts a lot of... Uh, Sometimes we could conceive receiving as weakness, but receiving is not weakness. Uh, I think that has to be said, that receiving is not weakness. So I think those, those in the West have to learn to receive and not or constantly contribute and give. And this is where reverse mission is very powerful as a post-colonial mission dynamism. I think that's fantastic because that's, really the central philosophy of the Out of the Margins podcast. That's exactly what we want to do. We want to receive from people we might not usually receive from in the West. So I'm just trying to get my head around what you've described so far. It sounds like reverse mission is actually more of a descriptor of an organic movement than any particular project that a group of majority world people are involved in. Is that right? So there are two things going on in that sense. I think, what, what I suppose, let, let's start with a kind of a question. Is reverse mission, is it a phenomenon or is it a move of the spirit? I would argue that it is both. It is a phenomenon because of, um, because of the great reverse migration, uh, which Andrew Walls talks about. He said there are two kind of migratory patterns. We've had the European migration, which saw Europe went to the rest of the world. And now we have a reverse migration, which is people from the majority world coming back to the West. So we situate the reverse mission discourse within those two migratory narratives uh, uh, as it is. So it, it's a phenomenon from that perspective, but also it's a move of the spirit because there's a spontaneity that is happening in the sense that it's not a planned attempt. It's not like all the people from the majority will suddenly wake up and be like, you know what, I'm going to organize an, a coordinated attempt to go and evangelize the West. As far as I'm aware, that's the way it has happened. It's happened through spirit moving people in Latin America so that in the 1980s they come to a place and a decision that they saw Europe as the mission field. For Africans, prayer meetings go as far back as the 1930s and 50s where they start to think that God was going to use them to plant churches across the world. And so you have different prayer movements that started organically in different parts of Africa. 
And within those prayer movements, people sensing that God was calling them to engage in global mission. So it, it is God's spirit moving people in different paths and saying, you know what, I'm calling you. Or people coming on a holiday and suddenly realizing that God has called them to be here. Or people coming here as a refugee and then later picking up that call. Or people being sent intentionally by their church, like in my own story, and other friends that I'm aware of who they were sent intentionally to come and plant churches. So it's a mixed picture. So it is a phenomenon. It's also a move of the Spirit, uh, where God is moving people intentionally. Well, I think for me, the thing that it has been really surprising, um, shouldn't be surprising, but I think moving to New Zealand, so I moved here uh, seven years ago to do my bachelor's, and... Uh, I moved here with the intention of I was going to be here for three years, do my study, and but I knew that I, while I was here, I wanted to really intentionally be connected and integrated into the community here to learn another culture, to understand the way people live and and love and work here, and so I was really intentional about becoming a part of the culture that I'm going to be then living in. And when I when I moved and started to do that and discovered the way that our cultures are just so different, and I kind of assumed that because we both speak English, then how how different can it be? Um, as it turns out, very very different. And I discovered like completely like our worldviews, the way that we approach and see situations um, is uh, is so diverse. And in that, I found that the way that we see God and understand God and understand the movement of God and the gospel is also really different. But in choosing to um, learn this culture i discovered uh, i discovered more of god than what i had on my in a sense on my own and at the same time also discovered what is different about the way that i see god and the way that i see the world and i think those two things have just been so incredibly phenomenal and amazing and such a gift and i feel like i've discovered more of god in my and myself and discovered more of god um, instead of another culture. So I think for me, the thing the the thing that just really ignites my passion is like, oh my goodness, guys, there's so much more of God to be known if we just allow ourselves to look for him in the in another way, in another place, and not be so afraid and um, of what the difference could bring to us. So that's what really like makes me passionate about it. I, I think we're certainly on the same page in terms of the philosophy of what this podcast is all about too. So I think yeah. that's fantastic. One one of the things that's that's really helping me to understand what's going on with reverse mission is the way yeah. that you and Israel have been talking about it. It's more of a exchange. Yeah. One of the things that we've been talking about is uh, Samuel Escobar, who's a professor of missiology at Eastern Baptist Theological Sem- Seminary. He's a big champion of reverse mission, and he talks a lot about... Uh, what he called mission from below. He said that the big difference between reverse mission and the traditional model of Western churches is that it emphasizes this this humble attitude of mission. And I want to talk a little bit more about the concept of mission from below. Do you agree that the idea of mission from below is at the heart of what you're talking about here yeah i mean i hadn't i hadn't ever come across this uh, concept of the mission from below upon reading it then i was like oh my gosh this is exactly that's exactly what's happening and i think that's definitely been my experience i think that i have seen i think i'm really aware of the lack of power and privilege i have moving from the majority world to the west um and mostly and just in terms of like the way that people see me and and even the way that i see myself and kind of like leftover things from colonization and the way that the the, the um narrative that the west is best and that's something that um i grew up being told very indirectly but very like concretely put into into the way that we think about the world and so coming in, I think I'm, I was really aware or like had insecurity around um, my what it means for me to be Kenyan, what it means for me to be African. Like I'm really aware of those things, but not feeling confident in them and and and, and coming in feeling like, oh, I'm the person who needs to learn in this space. Um, and so there's a sense in which uh, there's a real like fight to try and, and not take that on. 
um, and be, and be more confident in the in the way that I, in the culture and the way that I've been created and the space that I was brought up in um, and the beauty of all that's there. But I also think, and, I, and so I think I've kind of always seen it as like a, a like a negative thing. But I think there's also the the concept of like strength and weakness of because of coming in with the mindset of I'm not the person, I'm definitely not, I don't see myself coming in here to bring some good news to people who don't don't have anything. That's not that I have being in this country. Um, and instead it's one of, there is, a, there is a God to be known and seen among the way that people live here. And I want to be a part of, of seeing that. There's something that God is doing here. And for some crazy reason, he's chosen, he's, he's called me to be in this place. And what how can I participate in what God is doing here and how do the things that I bring um enhance what God is doing in this place? How can I learn? How can how can other people um learn from the way that I see things? And so in a sense I've been forced to I think like that because the alternate of oh I've got all the answers and I'm coming to tell you about them just isn't available because of the because of the of just how the world is set up. So I think, Edgar, when I started to understand that this was more of an organic phenomenon, not something that was some sort of project by a bunch of different majority world people, it actually really yeah. changed my understanding and my heart for that. I thought it was really, really powerful what Israel said about this being a work of the Holy Spirit. I, I mean, majority world people are being placed into contexts in the West where they're being called to mission by something greater than themselves. And I, I think that's actually quite beautiful. Yes, it was quite insightful to hear Israel explaining how, because of migration, a refugee can be a missionary, a student can be a missionary, someone migrating because of work can be a missionary. So hearing how reverse mission works in this organic fashion, where people who might have not been intentional about it from the beginning, they the fact that they end up in ministry proves how the spirit works in this world where migration just happens because of different reasons. And I, I think actually, now that I think about it more, it actually fits really well with the philosophy of this podcast. I mean, the, the first thing for me is that I was coming at this from a really Western perspective. You know, we, we, we sort of don't... Uh, allow things to happen mm -hmm. organically um we we really like to to have a plan and a project and to have some sort mm. of organization right. with some snazzy name and a <laughs> and a whole thing and a whole plan laid out um but th there's a certain beauty about about this that people are open to a move of the holy spirit and i think that's something that i have really mm. learned from these majority world perspectives that that that's something that you can do. Um, so that's really fantastic. And the other thing is that I think that there's a certain amount of beauty in encouraging the church to be more intercultural. Uh, yeah. Certainly just from mm. the two episodes that we've had so far, there's a lot of wisdom to draw from people all around the world. And we it can really help to challenge us to remember that the, the West isn't necessarily the best, but that we've got lots and lots of great wisdom to share amongst each other. And so the church is actually stronger when it's more diverse. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm totally, totally turned around on this. So um, this, is, this is really, really exciting. Um, that there have still been some major criticisms of the phenomenon of reverse yeah. mission. The major one, I think, is the concept of reverse colonization. The idea is that whenever we have this cultural exchange, one culture imposes itself itself on the other. And so, in a way, if majority world people are coming to the West, uh, they are bringing with them a message that is contextualized to their own culture and therefore uh, just like how we criticize westerners going into the majority world uh, the majority world people could be imposing their culture onto us now um, 
Now, I, I brought that to Israel mm. and Shiro, um, but I wanted to speak a little bit about your experience, Edgar. You and Kamwende are both ministering in a context outside of your own, and so in a very mm. real way, you're you're doing reverse mission yourselves. And so what would you say about that criticism, do you think? Well, I, I don't think it's the same because as Samuel Escobar puts it, this is a mission from below. Brothers and sisters from the majority world are not coming to the West to impose a way of, of living or a tradition. The, so the power imbalance is not there. I can think of my own life, for example. I came to Australia as a student with no intention to work in ministry. However, because of what's working in my own life, I, I decided to, to study Bible College here in Melbourne. And the opportunities to serve at church just, just came organically, from leading Bible studies to preaching, also in my work with Langham Partnership, to be able to champion, to bring awareness of the church in the majority world in the context of Australia. Well, that's quite amazing for me. I never thought I would end up doing this work when I first came to Australia. But however, here I am. Yeah, actually, Shiro said something um, quite similar to that as well. Um, so I, I, I think even just defining the concept of reverse mission itself uh, really helps us to debunk this criticism. Uh, yeah. But... Uh, just like just like you uh, have given us there, and, and some really similar uh, responses from Israel and Shiro, uh, reacting to this criticism really helps uh, to to broaden our understanding of what reverse mission actually is. I, I mean, the next question is interesting because I think that. Uh, You've already basically blown this criticism out of the water, but this is sort of the biggest criticism of the concept of reverse mission. Um, so there's this concept in uh, at Langham Partnership that we want to build up Indigenous leaders in certain areas because we believe that uh, people who live within a culture are best suited to understand its context. And so one of the biggest criticisms of, of Western mission is that Westerners are coming in with no real concept of the culture that they're going into, yeah. and then they start imposing Western culture onto that uh, group of people. And so the criticism is that reverse mission introduces all of these problems in reverse. Uh, majority mm. world people aren't as equipped to know the context yeah. of the culture that they're going into as Western evangelicals who are already there. Mm. How would you respond to people who say this kind of thing? I can understand where that's coming from. Part of me thinks that potentially globalization has gone too far for one culture to dominate the way that the West has ever again. Also because uh, we kind of group the majority world as having some monoculture, which is not really how it works. So it would have to be Africa somehow as an entire continent takes over all of the theology of all the other countries. You know, like it's, um, I, don't, I don't think that's, I think that's quite unlikely to happen. But I would, I would want to push back on the idea that, that the people who live within a culture are best suited to understand its context. And I think that upon moving here and discovering another culture, it showed me my blind spots of things that I thought that were just like, oh, this is just a normal, this is just how you live. This is just how you do well, this is just how you think. And suddenly experiencing something different, I was like, oh, that's the way I'm doing things is actually a different way of doing things from the way somebody else would do them. So in a sense, I discovered more of what it means for me to be African and being Kenyan as a result of being a part of another culture and so if only the only people you're surrounded with are people who think and live like you you're swimming in water you, you can't name and then you don't know that then you're 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 kind of blindsided and you're blind to your own self and i think it takes being encounter encountering something that's different for you to discover wh who you are and so i think that even just just by looking at the way um, being in relationship with other people what that does for discovering who we are i think there is something good to be found in opening up ourselves to 
another culture. But that being said, I think the fear that comes from here is has come from the Western model of um, mission, which is has been what has kind of driven things for the last several decades, where people were moving from the West with the idea that they had the answers and they weren't coming into another, they weren't coming into Kenya thinking, wow, these are people who are made and created in the image of God and God has based something of himself in these people. And we want to come and discover what that is. We want to come and see how God is living in this country and this place. And we're going to learn the language and be a part of it and try and see God and be a part of what God is doing here. That's not the mindset we're coming with at all. And it's like, and if you're coming into the mindset of being like, I have the answers and you guys need to take on my ideas, then yeah, you would be afraid that people would come in and colonize, which is exactly what happened. But but I think the reverse mission, because of the history of mission and Christianity, people aren't coming in saying, or you need to embrace an African way of seeing the world or an African theology. And, and so, in, and actually, and partly because of that, I'm really hesitant to call myself a missionary or to say that I'm doing mission because the pictures that people have associated with that is not what, is not what I'm doing here. Like, it's not... I'm, I'm not here with answers and I'm not here to convert people to become African Christians. Like, I don't even, whatever that is, you know, I'm, that's not, the, the mindset is so different. And so um, I think that it's, I think that it's really, I think it's really unlikely that um, that's going to come in because people were coming in saying, God is doing something in your country. There's something here. There's something about the way that you guys worship and think. And there's something about the way that you live and see the world that is allowing you to connect with God and is allowing you to worship and is allowing you to do some things really well. What can we, how can we join in that? And how can the things that we bring make that better? How can the things that you bring make our our the way that we see God better and in a sense we're just kind of uh looking and we're like actively looking for this um fulfillment of God's kingdom when he comes back and there's people from every tribe and nation worshiping God that's what we're trying to we're trying to be able to experience that now I don't think replacement is anybody I don't think replacement is the goal and I think for people who do have replacement of one theology for another as the goal um that that's really problematic and that that would be that that would be terrifying and that would be concerning um because that's not, I don't think that's how it's supposed to be anyway. Of course, I think any discussion about an intercultural exchange would be incomplete without talking about some of the complications that go in the other direction. Israel really helped me to understand the experience of working through the complications of racism in his ministry. And Shiro had some really important insights into her experiences being in another culture. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about what your own context is like? You, you told us your story about how you came to the UK in 2004. What's been your experience since then? So since 2004, I've managed to lead three different churches, um, you know, who churches that will be described as multicultural churches, all very different. The first one can be described as a, as a multicultural uh, Baptist church. The second church will be described actually as a white majority church. And then the last church can be described as a black majority multicultural church. So all very different. And now working for the Evangelical Alliance, which is a, a British Western evangelical organization. It's taking that conversation to a national, international level in terms of working within a British church network. So for me, that's the way reverse mission is. I, I'm in a place now where I'm providing training and thinking and empowerment to other reverse missionaries. So I've gone from leading multicultural churches to now in a strategic place where I'm providing insights and experiences around some of the subject and also teaching about it and writing and researching around it. Uh, so I've done a lot of research around it as well. And actually, it was also the subject of my PhD. I'd like to explore that a little bit more because you said well, you led a majority white church and you led a very multicultural church. And I think that something that there's sort of two groups of people that might be reached through reverse mission here. There's this greater cultural shift in Europe and Britain and definitely also Australia here where there's a waning uh, real religiosity. Christendom is, is becoming less of the cultural norm. 
And so there's a sense in which there is a need for people to come and bring the gospel to the white Western population. But we also know there's a reverse migrant population. What would you say? Is reverse mission all, all more about reaching the white wealthy West or is it about reaching the diaspora or is, is it something in between? So I think one of the things people think around reverse mission, because when we think about European missions to other parts of the world, there was a mixture of colonization. So there's a question around is reverse mission, reverse colonization. And the best way to answer that question is put it this way. I don't think Africans, Asians, and Latin Americans, we have that enough power to say we are colonizing the West. So the mission that took place from Europe to the rest of the world happened from a superior place to an inferior place. Now that we are coming back in reverse, it's coming from developing cultures and countries to the developed world. But having said that, yes, there are churches where they are employing mono, monocultural or monoethnic strategies uh, such as Africans reaching out to Africans or Latin Americans reaching out to Latin Americans and so on. Uh, and so we have that uh, that is going on, but that's not the total picture. Uh, we have cases where there are African, Asian or Latin American pastors are leading multicultural churches and some are even leading intercultural churches uh, you know so and some are living in white majority churches we have to look at the mixture we have to look at the whole picture to be able to make an informed decision oftentimes people just look at one picture of oh well the africans are leading african churches so reverse mission is not happening but we need to look at the other picture where you have, might have an asian pastor leading an asian church and so uh, so we have to look at that, but we are not engaging in reverse colonization as far as I'm aware. I've certainly read in some of your work, you've engaged in that particular criticism of reverse mission as a concept. Uh, our last episode actually was about contextualization and being able to bring the gospel into an, into a culture appropriately. And so... I think this is probably really important for anyone doing ministry anywhere in the world these days. How do you engage culturally in a culturally sensitive way in churches that have this diverse set of cultures when it's, you know, an intercultural congregation that you're pastoring to? So I think um, I make a distinction between multicultural and intercultural. Uh, multicultural churches, we have so many of them all over the Western Hemisphere. Uh, but oftentimes, it's still a Western way of doing church sometimes um, because the idea that premise some of them is we still want people to become Western. We want people to join our church. We want people to be part of our fellowship and we want them to be like us. We don't say that sometimes, but the way oftentimes we treat or the way, the way we welcome foreigners is that we want them to still assimilate to be like us. And that's a problem. Whereas in an intercultural church, at the heart of it is integration. Uh, at the heart of it is we are creating something totally new. It's not Western. It's not African. We create, we're on a journey to creating something new. But what that means is that we are allowing for ethnic difference in our churches, in our networks, in our spaces. We are allowing for authenticity. So, and that will require welcoming, but also creating a sense of belonging. Now, welcoming is very different from belonging. There are many churches that do welcome well, and that will be many multicultural churches, but creating a sense of belonging for people it's a different conversation altogether. And that's where intercultural churches comes in, where they take the welcome into a next level of creating that sense of belonging and purpose and that people feel they can contribute, they are part of it. So it's not just in terms of representation, because multicultural churches are usually representative, 
but the power dynamics and the structure is still of one particular culture. Whereas in an intercultural church, that shifts so that it's not one culture that is still dominating. Uh, it is a mixture of people that are contributing and are shaping that ecclesiology as it is. And the gospel can really speak into that, I think, like the eschatological reality of every tribe, tongue, and nation. The, the gospel can. It can, because when we look at Ephesians, this is where Paul's letter is very powerful to the Ephesians. Both chapter 1 and chapter 2 speaks to this. In chapter 3, it talks about the manifold wisdom of God. And the only way we can exercise that is through an intercultural church. Uh, you know, the manifold wisdom of God that is deposited in different culture, in different people. But he also talks about God making a new humanity church. Uh, when he talks about the Jews and the Gentiles becoming one in Christ, he talks about the new humanity church. The new humanity church, I want to submit, is an intercultural church, not a multicultural church. Uh, and that's what Paul was talking about in Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Uh, and so he talks about this uh, horizontal relationship with God and then the vertical relationship with, you know, with, uh, you know, with, with each other as well. So we need both the horizontal relationship and the vertical relationship to connect with God so that uh, we are reconciled with God, but also the need for us to reconcile divided and polarized humanity so that the church can be an expression of a countercultural kingdom. The challenges, uh, what of course, initially was coming in the culture shock you experience. Uh, so that, 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 that was one in terms of uh, you have to reorientate yourself coming from the majority world into uh, the so called first world in that sense. Uh, but for me, the major challenge within the church is still the reluctance to accept or receive the contribution from the majority world. Uh, I think that's still a massive barrier as far as I'm aware of in terms of how we still treat other people who have come in or not recognizing their expertise or experience. It was only the death of, it, only, it took the death of George Floyd for some spaces to be having those conversations. Uh, I mean, it, it took the death of George Floyd, that, that already tells you that something is wrong why wait to the death of someone before you have those conversations? Uh, so it, it was the death of George Floyd that really woke so many churches up in, in Britain. Uh, you know, because we've been having this conversation for a while, but people were not really listening or taking it seriously. And then the death of George Floyd was like, okay, this is really serious. This is real. We need to talk about these things. So I think it, it, it's a barrier because of the perception and because people don't want to talk about it uh, or they feel it's going to rock the boat but we have to talk about it if the church is going forward uh, we cannot ignore it we have to discuss issues around race racial justice and racial injustice in the church uh, but sometimes the church is not very good at talking about these things uh, because we feel uncomfortable about them so so yeah those are some of the barriers i still see have you seen some successes in that? Like, certainly there's been a huge revolutionary movement in 2020. Uh, how have you seen movement forward in that case of people starting to grow and, and move forward in a, a new, more sophisticated understanding of race? Um, yeah, so I think there are some opportunities or good examples that I see. So I've seen cases of uh, many Western organisations uh, employing at senior level people from the majority world and that that's good uh, that's um, that's a you know even the evangelical Alliance UK is a good example as I said I sit on the senior leadership team uh, and they've done that in the past as well so it's good we have those kind of examples to look at that it's possible and it's doable we need something to be model for us to see that there is a good practice around this. Or where I see churches, 
going beyond just representation, uh, going beyond just welcoming to creating that sense of belonging and integration for people. Uh, I think again that is to be celebrated and to you know to, to see as a good thing that we want to build on. Coming in from a uh, finding finding confidence or being able to like uh, understand and grow in my understanding of what it means for me to be Kenyan, what it means for me to be Kikuyu, what it means for me to be African, um, what it means to be for me to be a Christian in in all of those contexts and and in all of those ways. Like, am I a Kenyan Christian? Am I an African? Like, am I a Christian Kenyan? Like, um, and just figuring out, I guess, my own story and and. Uh, understanding who and how God has made me to be so that it can be something that can be an offering for the church and that I think is a real I think that's I think that's a struggle when you're already in an environment that affirms you and that's and I would say that would be like my home country like my home country in Kenya where I was surrounded by people who um, looked like me and loved me and uh, appreciated our the way that we do things and then moving to a place that that's not not always like not appreciated but just um i kind of have to like prove myself um that was that that has made it a challenge just trying to integrate into another culture um i think that 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 would be like an internal challenge and being able to package um and part of it being that i grew up in a country where i didn't have to think about the fact that I was black or Kenyan or African or whatever. And so suddenly moving away from it and then having to be able to package who I am to then be something to be offered to somebody else has been, that's really hard. Um, and the challenge, I guess like external challenges have, um, are partly arising from that of just trying to like connect and, integrate into the culture and with people and understanding how people think and um being a part of that and and trying to figure out how what is what is the good news for this culture um and how do i then promote that because in uh in kenya a culture that's very communal and people share a lot and people um the the good news of the gospel is the good news of the gospel is quite different from a culture that's really individualistic and people are trying to um, become self-sufficient and trying to not need other people. The, the, the message of what it means for this to be good news is, is like different. So trying to figure that out has been, um, it's a journey and I guess it's a journey that I'm still on and trying to understand and discover. Um, I think specifically in New Zealand, um, figuring out how to be a person that supports um, the story of the indigenous people of New Zealand um, has also been a real has also been a real challenge and so being able to like connect to that story in so many ways and um, and and wanting to be a person who is a part of bringing um, the kingdom of God to in in like a very justice type way to the indigenous people of this land and wanting that to be the gospel to be something that is good news for them and that my presence in this country will be something that's promoting um that is promoting uh flourishing for the indigenous people instead of not instead of the opposite and try to figure out what that what that looks like and how that works um has also been is also i guess is also a journey that um I'm on and that has made made it kind of challenging um but in a really exciting way challenging I think the challenges have been really exciting because I think for me I'm like on the other side of this is God on the other side of this is love on the other side of this is goodness and it's it's a challenge that I'm willing to engage in because um the the hope of what can come from it um is yeah is is kind of like is the force is that is that is like my driving force yeah of reverse mission I think is intercultural um, I, that would require some hard work <laughs> from missionaries from the majority world 
Uh, it will require some hard work, but I think the future is intercultural because I think that's where we need to be working towards to see how we can collaborate with Western organizations, uh, with Western people and churches. But that will require a lot of movement and compromise from both sides for it to be intercultural. Uh, but I think that's why I see as the future, especially in this context that we are in, with what I said earlier about what the death of George Floyd has done, it's kind of burst a bubble that we are not post-racial in the Western world and that we still have a lot of work to do. And so with that, uh, and with so many other things that has happened with the rise of Black Lives Matter again, and post-pandemic realities of suffering context, we definitely need to listen to our brothers and sisters who have experienced suffering for this suffering context. And again, that requires collaboration and listening to each other so that we can form an intercultural missionary movement in that sense. So that, that's why I see as the future, an intercultural missionary movement. Okay, uh, so, Edgar, what is one thing that you feel that you've learnt today from uh, this reverse mission discussion? One thing. Um, well, it has been very encouraging to know that even though people don't have the same resources or support when they migrate, still the gospel is being advanced. So to see how this is impacting the global church in, in a positive way and to see how God uses people from different contexts, no matter the situation, no matter the reasons why they move uh, to the West in the first place, just to see how God works in, a, in an organic way, it's just amazing. And to know that there are more brothers and sisters in a similar situation as, as my wife and I is quite encouraging, and praise God for that. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think I've been really... Um I've just been really challenged on my own prejudices, I think, that, that I, I brought this Western concept to this. Uh, I came with a, with a mind of criticism and uh, I was mm. really opened up to learn to approach mission with a humbleness, to allow for an organic... Um, uh, phenomenon to occur for a move of the Holy Spirit to occur um, I think that yeah. really um, really what this has called me to do is to be uh, humble in the way that I approach um, ministry um, in general um, to not try and control everything and, and make a project out of everything Um yeah, I think we have yeah. a really exciting future, um, and it's really been something that's not not done by any particular person, which is really that that's that's actually pretty cool. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, quite exciting. Uh, so, okay, so uh, homework for this week: what can we encourage our listeners to take away and use in their life and ministry over the next two weeks? I think. Uh, Take that concept of mission from below and approach your ministry and Christian life with a sense of humbleness. What about you, Edgar? Yeah. Well, I would say if you know someone at your church, someone from the majority world, I would say encourage that person. Don't, don't look down on their ministry or don't dismiss their ministry just because they don't have the official title of a missionary or they they haven't been sent by an organization to be a missionary but just recognize the way that God uses that person to advance the gospel I think that that can be quite rewarding all right thank you so much for tuning in to the out of the margins podcast uh, this has been another wonderful episode thank you for joining me Edgar a pleasure <laughs> looking forward to more episodes yeah so please if you would like to catch up with more episodes please subscribe at your podcatcher of choice and also uh, don't forget to 
to leave us a review. It will really help us to, to increase our visibility in, in, in both in Spotify or, or Apple Podcasts. So please leave us a review. And for the next, next episode, we will be talking about spiritual warfare. So uh, stay tuned for that too. Uh, yeah. So for next time, please drink your tea the African way. <laughs> Keep listening to voices from the majority world. <laughs> <laughs>